Uh, I'm Steve Calabresi from Northwestern Law School and the Federal Society for many, many years. Uh, thank you for coming to our Young Scholars paper presentation session, uh, uh, which is uh, being held now. Uh, this is the fifth year that we have featured a Young Scholars uh, presentation uh, at the annual faculty conference. and. Uh, our format for this will be that we will hear papers by a first group of three scholars, follows, followed by comments from our distinguished commentator, Professor Tom Merrill of Columbia, and then take questions and answers from the audience. We'll then take a short break and turn to our second group of scholars. They will give their papers, and Professor Merrill will comment on their papers, and we'll have questions from the audience about these. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Andrew Kent, a professor at Fordham Law School who writes in national security and constitutional law. He'll be presenting Our Damages Different, Bivens and National Security Law. Our second speaker will be Dr. Robert Leiter, a graduate of Yale Law School with a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown, who was an Olin Searle Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania and who is now clerking for Judge Diane Sykes. He will be presenting fe Federalism and the Military Power of the United States. Our third speaker will be Professor Aaron Nielsen, who teaches administrative law at BYU Law School. He will be presenting a paper on in defense of formal rulemaking. Our fourth speaker will be Professor Joshua Kleinfeld, who teaches criminal law and philosophy law at my own Northwestern Law School. He will be presenting a paper on redressive justice. And our final speaker will be Professor Ozan Barrow, who teaches comparative law and constitutional law at Lewis and Clark. He will be presenting a paper entitled Temporary Constitutions. Uh, thank you very much, and please join me in welcoming our first speaker. Thank you. I'm uh, glad to be here. It's nice to see some friendly faces in the audience. Uh, it's terrific uh, that I think I slipped under the wire. This is the last time I'm going to be uh, a young scholar. Um, and uh, at my age, it's great just to be called young in any context at all, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about remedies in constitutional litigation against the government, uh, and in particular in the national security and foreign affairs area. Uh, I'm talking mostly about the money damages remedy, the remedy uh, that was announced by the Supreme Court in 1971 in a case called Bivens where the court said that the Constitution allowed it to craft a cause of action and a money damages remedy uh, to sue federal officials uh, for constitutional torts. Uh, the judicial creativity involved in Bivens was required because there's no statute, uh, no general statute that allows money damages suits against uh, federal officers for constitutional violations. That's, uh, that is to say there's no uh, equivalent for federal officers of 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, the statute that uh, does allow suits against state and local officials who violate the Constitution. Uh, and my paper just uh, basically arose out of observations from, you know, from reading in the, in the National Security Law case law, uh, and the observation that there's a somewhat paradoxical, or at least seemingly paradoxical, situation with, with remedies against federal officials for alleged constitutional wrongs. Uh, some remedies are traditionally thought to involve much more judicial intrusion into the functioning of government than others, and in particular, it's, it's the prospective coercive remedies that are thought to be the most uh, core, ex uh, excuse me, the most intrusive. You know, injunctions, declaratory judgment, mandamus, uh, and habeas, which I think could be thought of it as a type of uh, a type of injunction. All those remedies, you know, stop the government from doing something that it wanted to do or, or was already doing, uh, and often uh, involve judicial uh, dictates about future conduct of the government. Uh, and by contrast, the retrospective award of money damages is, is usually thought to be much less intrusive into government functioning. You know, the government pays, that's the end of it, uh, no ongoing judicial supervision. Uh, now, as everybody knows, in, in, in lawsuits involving national security or foreign affairs, the federal courts are, are uh, very frequently say that judicial deference, at least some measure of judicial deference, is appropriate in those areas, both for separation of powers reasons and also because of uh, concerns like comparative institutional competence between the judiciary on the one hand, Congress and the executive on the other. Uh, and so based on that, on, on evaluating the intrusiveness of different remedies and the court's professed desire to be uh, somewhat deferential, we would probably expect, I think, to see courts shying away from using coercive remedies uh, in national security cases and being much more likely, uh, or at least more open, to a money damage remedy. Uh, in fact, though, the opposite is, is what's occurring. 
Uh, and there's an emerging consensus in the Federal Courts of Appeals that the Bivens money damages remedy is inappropriate in cases that have substantial foreign affairs or national security elements to them. Uh, and in these cases where the, where the courts are, are refusing to allow a Bivens suit to proceed uh, because of national security or foreign affairs concerns, the courts talk a lot about judicial deference, about separation of powers, about, about all the, the considerations that we might expect. Um, some of these cases involve you know, the most controversial, high-profile post-9-11 uh, events, things like rendition, uh, prisoner abuse in uh, Iraq, at Abu, Abu Ghraib in Afghanistan, uh, the military detention in the United States of, uh, of U.S. citizen Jose Padilla, the Valerie Plame case. In all these cases, the Courts of Appeals, and now it's the, the second, the fourth, seventh, ninth, and D.C. Circuit have all said that Bivens is inappropriate uh, because of the context of the case. Uh, and it's uh, clear that in all these cases, it was the remedy sought that, uh, that was what prevented the court from allowing the suit to go forward. Uh, and it's also clear in all these cases that there's essentially no other possible remedy. The people were no longer incarcerated or the government conduct was no, was no longer occurring, so any kind of coercive remedy would not have been uh, available. And now the, the many critics of these decisions, and there are many, I mean, the, the Academy is, is more or less unanimous in, in criticizing this. The uh, New York Times has written frequently about this. Um, and critics generally see these as examples of judicial abdication uh, of their role in checking abuse. Um, and examples of what uh, a lot of people think is sort of a, a tradition of the courts being uh, reluctant to confront the government during security emergencies. Uh, but I think that can't be right, uh, because at the same time that these courts of appeals, who are very much following the guidance of, of the Supreme Court on this issue, at the same time that these courts of appeals are refusing to hear these uh, Bivens damages suits, the Supreme Court has been, uh, to my mind, e extremely assertive, uh, even aggressive in suits uh, in the national security area, but suits involving coercive remedies, uh, in, in, in particular habeas corpus. Some examples, I mean, there's obvious ones, Bermidian, Hamdan, Hamdi, Rasul, in the war and terror cases, uh, a case called Keith, which is the most important case about uh, national security su electronic surveillance, is a mandamus case. There's a number of cases in the immigration area, the Zavitas versus Davis and the St. Cyr case. Uh, and even going back to sort of the font of, of modern uh, separation of powers laws in the, in the foreign affairs area, the Youngstown case, you know, that was a suit where the government lost uh, and the plaintiffs were seeking a declaratory judgment and an injunction. Um, so the courts are not deferential to the executive and Congress across the board in national security and foreign relations cases. They're more deferential in some kinds of cases and, and, uh, and more assertive in other kinds of cases. Uh, some federal court scholars have different explanations for these, uh, these recent Bivens national security cases. They say, and, and it's true, that the Supreme Court in, in modern times is, um, uh, is fairly skeptical about judicially created causes of action in both statutory contexts and in the constitutional context, and so see these Bivens cases as just fairly um, unexceptional examples of, of that, of the court being um, uh, less willing to create a, a cause of action or a, allow a remedy that hasn't been approved by Congress. And I think there is some truth to that. But that is by no means a, a complete explanation because there's just as much judicial freelancing uh, in cases seeking injunctions or, or, or habeas remedies often as there is uh, with the Bivens case. Uh, you know, Bivens was created out of whole cloth by the court, uh, but also, you know, the only reason that courts uh, are able to issue injunctions in most federal question cases is not because any specific statute authorizes it, but because they've applied that from the federal question uh, jurisdiction statute. And in habeas cases, of course, there are some statutes that expressly allow uh, the habeas remedy to be used. But uh, in modern times, the court has frequently uh, refused to follow congressional direction uh, with regard to when the, the, the habeas remedy can be used or not. So what's going on if these, if these two explanations are, are not sufficient? Uh, you know, my title of my paper asks, are damages different? Um, and I'm here to say I don't have any fully satisfying single answer to the, to the question. It's a, it's a bit of a puzzle. Um, but, you know, contrary to the, the pretty unanimous criticism of these decisions, um, you know, having thought this through, uh, I think that there are uh, a number of reasons to think that the courts are acting appropriately by being cautious about, um, about the damages remedy, you know, more cautious than they are about other types of remedies. Um, and th there are uh, about five reasons that I, I think it might make sense, uh, you know, that might be, you know, sort of uh, sympathetic explanations for what the courts are up to here. Uh, but before getting to those five, uh, my paper tries to put this in context. Um, with a couple general observations that are not at all specific to the national security area. And one is just about, you know, the changing function of the Supreme Court and, and uh, the lower federal courts. Uh, you know, it's often said, and I think this is correct, that uh, uh, courts uh, used to think of themselves much more as uh, individual providers of redress. 
uh, and in the modern era, we're moving much towards uh, a view, certainly at the level of the Supreme Court and Courts of Appeals, of seeing themselves as, as not, being, uh, not being primarily in the game of providing individual redress for individual litigants, but of uh, constitutional standard setting. Um, and this constitutional standard setting, I think, can be usefully thought of, and a, a number of uh, people, a number of scholars uh, have said this before me, can be usefully thought of as a kind of, uh, you know, kind of declaratory judgment, a perspective, uh, you know, system-wide uh, announcement of, of law that we expect, that the courts expect uh, executive officials um, to, you know, to read, to read the doctrines that the court announces in its opinions and to follow them going forward. Uh, and so, the, so just in general, the courts are not uh, as interested anymore or, or don't see it as, as, the, as the most important of their function to provide individual redress. And that, of course, is what the, you know, the tort suit for damages is. is it's the classic suit for individual redress. It's just not as high a priority for courts anymore. And the second general observation is that our administrative law has changed radically. You know, Jerry Mishaw had a, a wonderful series of articles tracing this over time. But to simplify enormously, you know, administrative law has changed from being common law suits, often for money damages, um, tried to juries for the most part, to, you know, with the rise of the Administrative Procedure Act and, and modern administrative law, to now involving not the common law, but federal law, not money damages relief, but course relief, uh, not juries as the primary decision makers, but judges. Um, and now five reasons, and I'll, I'll try to be quick, uh, why I think that, you know, the courts are, are acting appro appropriately and being somewhat cautious about money damages in, um, in national security cases. One is over-deterrence, which is what the, something the Supreme Court mentions quite frequently. Uh, that's the view that the prospect of individual liability for, um, for a, a federal official uh, will make them excessively risk-averse. And in the national security area, where we tend to think that um, uh, it's desirable that officials act quickly, act boldly, perhaps even act aggressively because of the, the stakes involved in the, uh, in, the, in the issues they're confronting, this over-deterrence could be very damaging. Uh, there's some dispute in the empirical literature about how much over-deterrence occurs. Some people think not very much. But Jack Goldsmith recently um, uh, wrote a terrific book in 2012 uh, where he interviewed a lot of national security officials, um, and this has been supplemented by my just talking to some folks, where I think people, um, people who serve in the, in, in the executive branch uh, involved in controversial actions do, to some extent, uh, seem to be wary of the prospect of, of damages suits against them. I, I mean, my sense is that there is, there is some possibility for over-deterrence. Second is discovery burdens. Individual, uh, individual officers are sued personally in Bivens actions, which is very different from what happens uh, in suits for coercive relief. And the law requires uh, that you know, they can only be held liable if their personal involvement the, uh, in the unconstitutional actions is, is demonstrated. And for those reasons, you know, the need for the plaintiff to show personal involvement by each specific named defendant, uh, my sense is uh, that judges are more likely to allow uh, a discovery that's intrusive, uh, you know, for individual officials than if, um, uh, if it's just, a, you know, an injunction sought to enjoin an entire statute for its operation or something of that effect. Um, third, and I would explain this in more detail if I uh, had more time, but uh, um, I'm convinced that allowing Bivens suits, allowing damages suits in the national security area would really vastly increase the pool of potential uh, claimants, meaning, meaning that the executive and the courts would have to handle uh, a hugely increased volume of litigation. Um, fourth uh, is the issue about transposing constitutional rights into, into new contexts. Uh, you know, our constitutional rights uh, were designed for the paradigm case of ordinary domestic, you know, workaday government uh, in the United States, not designed to apply to extraterritorial national security activity like military operations or rendition or covert action or intelligence gathering or what have you. Uh, and although the judiciary has been pushing a bit, moving, expanding our constitution outward outside the United States, expanding it a bit into the realms of national security, cases like Bermidian are good examples of that, uh, the courts are still uh, somewhat cautious about that and I think appropriately so. Uh, and then finally, um, something in my paper I refer to as the substitutability of remedies. Uh, we see it quite frequently uh, in Supreme Court case law uh, in, in all areas that when the court's deciding whether to uh, allow a particular kind of remedy, they often look at uh, what other types of both judicial and non-judicial remedies there, there might be available before you know, allowing a new one. Uh, so in a case about whether uh, there should be a, the exclusionary rule available for knock and announce vi uh, Fourth Amendment violations, the court looked at the professionalization of the police as a reason not to allow uh, 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 the exclusionary rule there. In, uh, in their case law about uh, immunity for prosecutors, the courts looked uh, and found that error correction could occur during the criminal appellate process and that prosecutors are already overseen by the organized bar and saw those as reasons not to uh, think that a money damages suit was, was available. 
Um, and in the national security area, I think there, there's some reason to think that there are a lot of uh, judicial and non-judicial remedies which are probably doing a pretty good job of keeping the government reasonably within the bounds of the law. And again, pointing to, um, to Goldsmith's uh, 2012 book, um, you know, he documents this. Um, you know, there's everything from a very aggressive uh, independent inspectors general within executive agencies, uh, a very aggressive press um, that's reporting on an ever-growing number of leaks, uh, you know, very successful FOIA litigation that is, uh, you know, plaintiffs are getting better and better at, at forcing uh, documents out of the government. Um, a lot of nonprofit organizations have become very adept at uh, sort of naming and shaming officials, government officials that they feel like are violating the law in the national security area. And so uh, what you know, Goldsmith calls this the, this, this new uh, ecology of, uh, of accountability. Um, and I, I think he's right that this, that this does exist, and that's uh, another reason why um, we might think, given you know, the potential costs of Bivens damages lawsuits, uh, that there's enough, uh, enough other uh, possible remedies in, in this area that uh, the lawsuits might not, be, uh, might not be necessary. Thank you. Um, Tom, would you like to comment after each person's talk, or would you prefer that the first three talks happen and then you comment? I'm not sure I can three. remember the first paper after all three papers. But I, I thought maybe it would be easier to comment. Yeah, why, why don't I do that if it's yeah. okay. Um, and we're going to open up to questions at that point or not? Uh, we'll take questions after the three, but if okay. you could all perhaps right. comment right. on each of the three. So I thought this was an extremely interesting paper. Um, uh, I, my, my biggest concern about it is that there are two puzzles here. One is the sort of uh, national security puzzle. Uh, and the way I would frame it is that, uh, you know, if you look at something like the Bill Eskridge, uh, Lauren Baer study in the Georgetown Law Review of deference to the executive, they found that over, over the course of history, the area that has received the greatest deference, and this was a study just of the Supreme Court, the area that's received the greatest deference has been national security and foreign affairs. Uh, so one puzzle is why uh, given this historic pattern of deference in, in the national security era, area, we suddenly see this intrusiveness uh, uh, that occurred uh, in the last uh, most recent period. The other puzzle is, I think, much more general and goes back much further, which is why we have this inversion of remedies in, in what I would call the public law area. It's not just constitutional law, but public law more generally. In private law, the general assumption is that damages are the normal remedy and injunctive or declaratory relief is exceptional. There's this maximum of equity that says that you have to show that the remedy of law is inadequate before you can get equitable relief. Uh, whereas it seems pretty clear that in the public law area, it's the flip of that. That as you, as you point out, uh, uh, the courts seem more comfortable with entering declaratory and injunctive relief than they do uh, with enter entering damages relief. And it's not just Bivens. I mean, I agree completely with your characterization of the Bivens case law that after bursting out of the gate with great fanfare uh, in the Bivens decision by Brennan uh, and then a couple more Brennan opinions, uh, the court has never recognized the Bivens cause of action uh, and keeps cutting back and cutting back and cutting back. But it's not just Bivens. I mean, you can look at something like the uh, uh, 11th Amendment jurisprudence where uh, the court is resolute in, in barring damage actions against the states but allows this ex parte young fiction uh, to uh, persist in uh, giving rise to all sorts of injunctive actions uh, and against uh, state uh, governments. Uh, or in, uh, it's not just the, ju the judiciary either, it's Congress. Congress has this very broad waiver of sovereign immunity under the Administrative Procedure Act for actions other than money damages, but when it comes to money damages, boy, you've got to go to the Claims Court under the Tucker Act, or you've got to file under the Federal Tort Claims Act, or you don't get any relief, and both of those are narrowly, those exceptions are narrowly cabined. So uh, there's this broader explanation. So and I'm, I'm not really convinced that conjoining these two puzzles together in a single paper um, is necessary or maybe even helpful. Uh, it might be uh, better to uh, sort of tackle, I, Personally, I find the general question much more interesting, you know, the inversion of remedies question much more interesting because it's endured for a long period of time. I don't really find the national security thing all that puzzling, and I hate to be utterly cynical about it, but I think what happened was that the elite bar and, you know, uh, basically didn't like the Bush administration, uh, and, uh, you know, these sort of cases involving uh, detainees were a convenient whipping boy. Uh, 
uh, in order to attack the Bush administration. I think there's been a dramatic fall off in this litigation with the election of President Obama. Uh, and uh, that's not very interesting to me. That's just sort of like uh, another sad story about how partisan you know, bias inf infects the Supreme Court. Um, but I do think this longer standing pattern of inversion of remedies in the public law area is quite fascinating and something that uh, deserves uh, an explanation. Um, the one I like the best, uh, which you kind of glanced over a little bit, uh, is uh, basically the, the suggestion that the courts have increased, the Supreme Court in particular, increasingly views itself as a kind of uh, law-making body or, or a law-declaring body, that uh, uh, it has basically been given authority under certain clauses of the Constitution and certain statutes to legislate for the nation and um, it's more congenial to do that through injunctive and declaratory relief than through damages uh, uh, because you can sort of accomplish what you want to do through a forward-looking relief. And like most legislation, uh, uh, retroactive lawmaking is very messy. It creates lots of uh, sense of injustice. It creates pushback and so forth. So if, you, if the Supreme Court sees its function as basically making law in these delegated areas under the Constitution, why not just use uh, injunctive remedies uh, rather than worrying with the messiness of damages. Uh, as you say, damages would multiply the number of cases and to some extent uh, the lower courts would get involved in these cases and the Supreme Court might lose control. And if you seal yourself as a sort of legislative body who cares about individual claimants whose rights have been violated, you know, they're just sort of collateral damage. Uh, uh, we don't have to worry about them as long as we have the power to declare what the law is. Um, uh, independently of that. Um, some of these institutional explanations that you give that are sort of key to the national security area strike me as also applying to uh, the more general question, the, the over-deterrence problem, the fact that, you know, individuals are sued personally. Those are also problems for ordinary executive actors, not just people in the national security area. Uh, and some of them, uh, your explanations, um, uh, I think, uh, don't really explain uh, uh, why damages are uniquely disfavored. Uh, I mean, the, the substitutability point, I think, would also apply to certain types of injunctive remedies. You've got the, you know, we've got the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the other, me other administrative mechanisms, the uh, 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 watchdogs and so forth that are set up administratively. Uh, they could also obviate the need for injunctive remedies, but that doesn't seem to be the court's attitude. It's only, uh, they only do away with the need for damages. I don't have a good theory. I think this is an area of the law that needs a smart person like yourself to uh, think about uh, very systematically as to why it's, it's not just federal, it's also, you know, state uh, law. It's not just the courts, it's also the legislatures that have favored injunctive relief over damages in the public law area. Uh, and um, uh, I, think, uh, I think that is the big uh, question that, uh, uh, that, you, uh, that you want to devote yourself to going forward. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Professor Robert Leiter for 10 minutes. Thanks. So for nearly 100 years, uh, the Supreme Court has recognized the supremacy of federal power in the area of military affairs. The court has held that the power to raise and support armies is plenary and unrestrained by the militia clauses, uh, that all or nearly all members of the organized militia, including its officers' corps, can be required to join the national army and that if Congress wants to ignore the limitations of the militia clauses, Congress can simply incorporate the militia into the National Army. So, and this view of plenary federal power over the military tends to cross political and judicial ideological divides. But having fully nationalized armed forces is not the system that the Constitution created. The framers actually uh, divided the military power between federal and state governments. And to ensure an adequate check on federal power uh, by the state governments, the framers placed three safeguards in the Constitution. First, they separated the armies and the militia. Second, they placed restrictions on the federal government's use of the militia. And third, they insulated militia officers uh, from direct supervision and federal supervision in peacetime. Now today, all three of these uh, checks have been dismantled. My paper explains the destruction of military federalism, and then it explains why this destruction has continuing relevance for contemporary constitutional debates over the military. So before discussing uh, the destruction of military federalism, I would like to briefly explain how the framers divided the military forces between federal and state governments. Uh, 
On the federal side, we're the professional forces. So Congress has plenary authority to raise and regulate the Army and Navy of the United States, and the President appoints the officers. Uh, in peacetime, states have no role to play on the professional side. They're prohibited without explicit congressional consent from raising professional forces. Now, the state governments had primary access only to the non-professional forces, the militia. And for the colonies, and under the Articles of Confederation, uh, each state had its own separate militia. Now, the Constitution radically changed this approach, largely, but not entirely, nationalizing the militia. So the Constitution grants Congress plenary authority to provide for the militia's arming, organization, and discipline with the objective of having interoperable militia forces across the United States. Uh, so when we often hear of the militia referred to as the state militia, I think that's somewhat of an unfortunate misnomer. Uh, after the Constitution, we have a national militia organized at the state level, just like Britain had a national militia which was organized at the county level. Now this nationalization leaves the states with three primary powers. First, they can train the militia, but this power extends only to training according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. Second, the states appoint the officers. And third, for local emergencies, states have access to their own state's militia when that militia is not in actual federal service. So the Constitution contemplates two sets of forces professional services under exclusive federal control with officers beholden to federal political leaders, and non-professional forces which are shared between the federal and state governments, but with officers beholden to state political leaders, not federal. And this system of, this system of interoperable forces that could nevertheless check each other's power received its first major break when the federal government assumed the power of conscription. Uh, the idea that Congress lacks the power to conscript soldiers may seem odd. The Constitution grants Congress plenary authority to raise armies without any textual limitation as to method, uh, which led the Supreme Court in the selective draft law cases to uphold the wartime draft. But the power to conscript soldiers destroys the distinction between militia and army. Congress has emergency power to call forth the militia to execute the laws, to suppress insurrections, and repel invasions what I will call the uh, three enumerated emergencies. The inability of Congress to federalize the militia outside of these emergencies is significant. Partially, it serves as a limitation of federal power. Congress can't use the militia, for example, to conduct foreign invasions. And it implicates the personal rights of people subject to military service. So the militia, for example, can't be forced out of their states of residence except during the enumerated emergencies. And they are not subject to military law except in wartime. Army soldiers have none of these protections. With conscription, Congress gains access to the militia outside of the enumerated emergencies by simply collapsing the militia into the army. Militia officers who are supposed to be insulated from direct federal control in peacetime may be conscripted. The personal rights uh, secured to citizens serving in the militia can be compromised because unlike the militia, members of the army are subject to military law at all times based on their status, not just during wartime. And the paper also goes into some of the historical evidence. So although the power to raise armies may seem plenary, when we look across the constitutional provisions, uh, the power to draft significantly erodes the framers' scheme to limit federal military power. So the draft's legitimacy is the first major way in which the army militia distinction has collapsed. The second way is by collapsing the organized militia into the army through the National Guard system. Now the National Guard is actually two separate organizations. The National Guard of a state, for example, the National Guard of New York, is part of the organized militia of that state. But there's also an organization called the National Guard of the United States, which is part of the U.S. Army Reserve. And so when someone enlists in the National Guard, they actually execute two enlistments, one to the National Guard of the state, and the second to the National Guard of the United States, joining both the organized militia and the Army Reserve. Why have two overlapping, in fact, coextensive organizations? Congress created the National Guard system to evade the limitations on the militia. Uh, 
So if the federal go suppose the federal government wants to send the militia to Iraq to assist the regular army. That's outside of the enumerated emergency, so it can't call forth the militia for those purposes. But by making members of the militia also members of the army, Congress can call them forth as members of the army and uh, send them into foreign battle. Now, in a case called Perpich versus Department of Defense, the Supreme Court, in a unanimous opinion, left little doubt that it viewed the arrangement as constitutional, even though it didn't formally uphold its constitutionality. Uh, in this section of the paper, I argue that dual enlistment is unconstitutional for two reasons. Uh, first, and I think the paper's, perhaps the paper's boldest claim, is I argue that the Army Reserve itself is unconstitutional. The, the Army Reserve is an organized militia. It's not an army, and so it's subject to the militia clauses. And the second reason that I'll get to in a minute is that dual enlistment interferes with the rights of states to appoint the officers. So the Constitution gives Congress the power to raise and support armies with the one limitation that no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a term longer than two years. Except for the appropriations limitations, the framers rejected virtually every attempt to limit the army power. Uh, given this history, the constitutionality of the Army Reserve seems like an easy case. If the federal government can seek enlistments of one, two, or ten years, why can't it require 40 weekends of service during that time period? But my answer to this question is that the Army Reserve is a part of the militia. Although fed the federal government has plenary authority over federal armies, this begs the question. The force at issue still must be an army, as that term is understood in the Constitution, uh, which the Army Reserve plainly is not. So as I described earlier, the Constitution differentiates two different sets of land forces, armies and militia. <laughs> And when we look back to the framing history, the universal usage of the term armies referred to regular forces. Militia, in contrast, referred to the entire able-bodied population that by law was callable an emergency, and outside of those emergencies either were subject or could be made subject to periodic military service. In other words, either somebody's principally employed as a soldier or somebody has a normal occupation but is subject to occasional military exercises. The framers understood armies only to comprise regular forces. Part-time soldiers, by definition, were militia. There was no third category of army subject only to occasional military exercises, which is what the Army Reserve purports to be. Thus, the Army Reserve is an organized militia, and I think its unconstitutionality is also confirmed when we look at these debates during the Constitutional Convention. Uh, the delegates specifically rejected a plan from George Mason to provide the federal government with its own organized militia. So collapsing the organized militia into the army is the second way in which federal military power has exceeded its original constitutional limits. Unfortunately, we need to kind of wrap up. Okay, so uh, I'll give the very quick overview then of the th third way is uh, my argument is that the militia officer clause uh, reserved to the state's sole and exclusive appointment of militia officers and because of dual enlistment, in actuality, the federal government has to approve militia officers before the federal government can maintain it. And then uh, the 32nd version of the continuing relevance, I think this has enormous importance for separation of powers. When we look at laws like the War Powers Act, we have a couple different sides, one of which argues that Congress has to initiate the conflict, and another which uh, says that the President has inherent uh, preclusive authority to initiate war. But in actuality, Congress's power is greatly enhanced because the President has access both to the regular army and to a large federal organized militia, which enables the president to initiate war much more easily than uh, at the framing when the president would have to go to Congress and seek an increase in the voluntary enlistments before sending troops to war. And then the paper also explains uh, potential limits of conscription today, including the fact that I think conscription into the Army Reserve is unconstitutional. Professor Mayo. Great. So uh, I like this paper. It brought back lots of memories. Uh, Many years ago when I was uh, in the Justice Department, I was part of the team that defended the uh, sending of the National Guard of Minnesota and uh, New York to Central America to train uh, to intimidate the Sandinistas uh, and was challenged by Rudy Perpich, governor of Minnesota, as violating the militia clauses and uh, uh, we successfully fended that off in the Supreme Court. The team consisted of Ken Starr, myself, and uh, 
Paul Larkin, who's now a lawyer at the Heritage Foundation. So it's interesting that the politics at that time were that the, uh, uh, the conservatives, I guess, were sort of in favor of this sort of latitudinarian interpretation of the Constitution, um, and the uh, liberals were in favor of strict originalism uh, uh, in limiting the uh, scope of the government to uh, change uh, the militia clause or, or interpret the militia clause. Um, it's an interesting uh, argument here. Um, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's not really a textual argument. It's hard to argue that the text of the Constitution is inconsistent with the modern National Guard and, and the arrangements. Uh, the argument is really that it, uh, uh, it violates the structure of the Constitution and implicitly the purposes uh, for which the Constitution established the militia clauses in addition to the power to raise and support armies. I, I'm not convinced by the argument that the power to have uh, conscription violates the militia clauses. This is really an argument about power having the potentiality to destroy, but it's like other arguments, the power of tax, taxation, and so forth, has the potential to destroy, and as Holmes said, not while the court sits. I'm, I, 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 you know, I don't think the power to conscript has been used to destroy the militia. My understanding is, maybe I'm uh, misremembering this, that the National Guard is entirely voluntary. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to volunteer to join the National Guard. In fact, the main incentive to do that is to avoid being drafted. Um, and uh, it would be only if the, if the conscription power were used so broadly as to dry up the pool of people who might serve in the militia that you would have the destruction of the state militias uh, through conscription. And, and, and that seems to me to be a kind of hypothetical argument about the misuse of power that's not entirely persuasive. The point about the dual enrollment uh, uh, clause, again, no one's forced uh, to become a, both a state militia officer and a member of the United States National Guard. People sign up for this voluntarily, and the states agree voluntarily to participate in this dual scheme. Of course, the inducement is, and I think you mentioned this, that the gov federal government pays 100 percent of the costs of the National Guard. Um, Am I right about that? I think it's 95, but yeah, it's almost it's all, uh, Anyway, it's, a, it's the old story about conditional spending. The, the Congress has dangled the carrot of funding in front of the states, and they've all complied by setting up this dual system. But nothing uh, in law prohibits the state of New York from having its own state militia. It would have to be organized under the disciplinary rules established by Congress and would be vulnerable to being called into the federal service and so forth. Uh, but they could do that as long as they were willing to forego the funding uh, that has been uh, placed before them. So it really becomes an argument about the uh, limits of conditional spending. The thing that fascinates me the most about the papers, I think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, illustration of the challenges of, uh, of normatively justifying originalism uh, as a method of uh, constitutional interpretation. Um, uh, the framers, as I think you clearly set forth, had good reasons for this compromise that they established in the Constitution. They were really worried about a standing army and its threat to liberty. Uh, they had legitimate concerns about whether state militias uh, that were not subject to federal control uh, would be effective, an effective force to protect the country in times of danger. Uh, and some people may have thought that state militias would act as a counterfoil to federal, federal government in, in cases where the federal government was trying to encroach on uh, state prerogatives. Uh, but these arguments don't seem terribly persuasive today. I mean, the threat of a standing army was a realistic concern when the Constitution was adopted. We look at Egypt or, or Pakistan today and see that standing armies uh, are capable of interfering with politics. But for whatever reasons, we've managed to fix that in this country. We have a very disciplined professional army uh, and armed forces that don't interfere with the political process. Uh, the lessons about the difficulties of controlling the militia were amply illustrated in the Civil War, uh, that uh, it doesn't work uh, uh, to have uh, in independently organized state militias with officers appointed by state governors. Uh, uh, and finally, I don't think anybody would suggest that the federalism problems we have today, uh, like Obamacare, should be solved by having the st Texas state militia do battle with the U.S. Army on the Red River. Uh, we have uh, better uh, other means of resolving these conflicts rather than using state militias. Uh, so the argument for, I mean, it's an interesting argument. I don't see who would be motivated to try to support this originalist argument, uh, uh, given that the factual presuppositions have changed so radically over time. I think if the framers were resuscitated and instructed as to how the apprehensions that they had uh, at the time have evolved 
uh, since then, they would not be at all upset with the system of the National Guard that we have today. They would probably think it was quite, quite reasonable. So it raises very interesting questions as to what extent one wants to use structural arguments and arguments about purpose and original compromises to um, uh, interfere with practices that have evolved very substantially over time uh, under the uh, uh, current uh, Constitution. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now hear from Professor uh, Nielsen, who is speaking in defense of formal rulemaking. All right, thank you. So I'm going to begin my remarks with a question that I'm sure all of you are thinking, and that is formal rulemaking, what is it and why should I possibly care? Um, and I, I didn't get a laugh at that, so I'm glad that I, I have an audience who's been you know, chomping at the bit um, for obscure regulatory procedure. Uh, these are my kind of people. Um, I plead guilty. Uh, this paper is not a constitutional paper. It's not, you know, a deep question of, of how the Constitution works. It is an obscure form of regulatory procedure. Um, even so, I think it's important, and I think it could play an important role in the future of the administrative state. So what is formal rulemaking? Well, I'm going to begin by saying what it is not. Formal rulemaking is not informal rulemaking or notice and comment rulemaking of the kind that we're familiar with. And, and notice and comment rulemaking, the way it works is the agency has a proposed regulation. It files an NPRM, a notice of proposed rulemaking, in the Federal Registrar. It sends it out for public comments. So if it is going to affect your industry, uh, you hire an attorney, and they file comments, and they send it to the agency, and then the agency does something with it. But what they do, we don't know. You send the comment. And after a while, you wait, you know, 18 months, two years, who knows how long, they spit out the final, reg the final rule, um, which could be the same as the proposed rule, or it could be different. Um, and it could be um, that they've addressed every, every comment, you know, line by line, or it could be we've addressed general comments. You don't know what they've ever done with your particular comment, and you don't ever know um, how seriously they've taken, they they've taken what you've had to say. Um, as Gary Lawson has put it, this is a black box. Um, there's no guarantee that the reasons that the agency has given reflects its real thinking. You don't know that. Nor is there any guarantee that the agency ever seriously considered what you said at all. Uh, all you know, and for all you know, and increasingly likely, members of Congress or the White House have been on the phone calling the agency saying, this is what we want to happen all along. It was fixed. Before the rule was ever sent out for comments, they already had the end result in mind. And what now they've assembled is a gigantic record which they can cherry pick from to justify whatever outcome they wanted to reach all along. Um, you know, and this is particularly true. It's been called an era of blood sport rulemaking um, where you can't get anything through Congress. So you say, well, let's take it through the agencies. Um, and that's how the president can get the president's priorities through. Um, which means that you know, your comments you've been filing, your expert reports, everything you've put together, you don't know if it's ever done anything at all, um, and you're kind of stuck saying, huh, I guess, and then you're off to the DC Circuit to, to challenge this thing, and that's how it kind of works. That's not how it used to be. Um, and this is an interesting thing that, that we've often forgot. Long before the explosion of agencies, long before the APA, long before the New Deal, there was another model of, regula of regulation, and it was a formal model. The way it worked, and this goes back to the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the way it works is the agency would say, this is what we want to do. The burden then was on the agency in something akin to a trial to marshal its evidence and bring its evidence and present it. And they would present the evidence. Um, you know, they had an expert that called the expert, and they'd present the evidence, and then um, the, the, the regulated parties or the public would have an opportunity to cross-examine um, and say, well, have you considered this, have you considered that, um, to present their own evidence. Um, and all of this was on a closed record. It was, it was really like a trial. Was like, there was like a judge, you know, it wasn't a real judge, it was a hearing officer or head of the agency, but it was like a trial. Um, and at the end of the day, they would have a written comment, uh, a written decision, saying this is what we found, these are our findings of fact and conclusions of law, and they send it off, and, and, that's how, and that's how the process worked. And all of that would be subject to judicial review. That model of regulation disappeared in the New Deal. Uh, it was completely antithetical 
to the James Landis view of what administrative law ought to be, um, where agencies can't be shackled with so many procedures, they just be able to make the law and people should get out of the way and just let the experts be experts. Um, after the zeal for the New Deal faded, um, we got the APA. And in the APA, they struck a bargain. Um, and it, you know, it's right there, you can look at the APA, they're still in there today. They struck a bargain and they split rulemaking into two different things. They have formal rulemaking of the sort I've been talking about, it's still there, and they had informal rulemaking. And informal rulemaking or notice and comment rulemaking. Um, and if the statutes, if the agency's organic statute, the statute that creates the agency, says it has to be on the record, well, the APA says you have to use formal rulemaking. You have to go through something like the ICC. Um, it, you know, it's right there. But if it doesn't say that, if, the agency, if it just says the agency can do this without saying it has to have a hearing, well, then the agency can do notice and comment rulemaking. And this is how it worked for, even after 1946, the APA, up until 1973. And in 1973, the Supreme Court made a decision um, that effectively killed formal rulemaking. It's called Florida East Coast Railway. And in that decision, um, the, the court held that unless the, the organic statute uses magic words um, after, for, after uh, hearing after opportunity for whatever the magic words are, let me grab them here, um, on the record after opportunity for agency hearing, Informal rulemaking is sufficient. The problem is almost no statute uses those magic words. They, 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 they just don't exist. So after 1973, mm -hmm. this form of rulemaking has simply vanished from the administrative state. It's been, it's been kicked out. And why did that happen? It happened because the professoriate decided um, that formal rulemaking was too cumbersome to be worthwhile. Um, you know, they, even if they granted that it could make policy better sometimes, the idea that you could spend, you know, in a famous example, 10 years to decide what content of peanut in peanut butter, um, that, that, that was absurd. Um, and they said, this is nonsensical. Um, let's get rid of it. So if you read Florida East Coast Railway, it's, it's very clear uh, that this is not you know, the court at its legalistic best uh, reading the statute to figure out how this is supposed to work. Uh, it's the court saying, enough of this. We don't need formal rulemaking anymore. Um, you know, you had a, a vicious dissent um, by Justice Douglas. I realize that might not be great persuasive authority in this audience, especially in 1973. Douglas was not at his top form. Um, but you had, there are others too. You had Judge Friendly, um, and he agreed uh, with, just, with Justice Douglas on this, that as a matter of legal craft, Florida East Coast Railway cannot be defended. The decision simply does not what, it's not what the APA meant. Um, you've read out an entire section of the APA are now no longer taught to law students. Um, large sections of the statute are dead. Um, and that's not what the statute ever was meant to be. Um, that, that happened in 1973. You know, fast forward 40 years, we're still, it, there hasn't been a comeback of formal rulemaking. And the reason is some of the ideas that we had about formal rulemaking in the 70s that led to Florida East Coast Railway are still around. Uh, whenever anyone thinks about formal rulemaking, certain arguments come forward. Um, and my paper takes on those arguments and says, you know what, I grant, this what makes it an interesting, I think, idea. They're not wrong. The critiques of formal rulemaking are not wrong. Uh, nonetheless, they're incomplete. Um, they're, formal rulemaking, as compared to informal rulemaking, has serious flaws. Um, nonetheless, that, that's, not how we that's not how we make good rules. You say, all right, what are the costs? And you also say the other side of the ledger, what are the benefits? And the benefits of formal rulemaking have been largely forgotten. And I think that there might be ways going forward that formal rulemaking can solve some of the problems that have developed within formal rulemaking. I don't advocate this all the time um, because I, it's obviously, it, it can make things a lot harder. That's the point of formal rulemaking. It makes it much more difficult to do. Nonetheless, there might be opportunities when it could be useful. Uh, and I, th I argue in particular the very most expensive regulations and the most scientifically com complex regulations. A regulation, for, you know, for instance, you know, pick one from the, that comes out of the EPA that costs $20 billion. Um, the, the, upshot of, the upside of getting that right is so spectacularly high that a little bit more procedural formality might be worth it. Um, so I advocate um, there might be times when we want to consider bringing back the old model of regulation. Um, so, so what are the criticisms of formal rulemaking? 
Um, the mo one of the most common is it doesn't work for so-called legislative facts. Um, Cross-examination is it just isn't useful for policy judgments. Um, so there's legislative facts which are, uh, you know, uh, punishment deters crime or something like that. It's a it's a policy judgment. Uh, on the other hand, it's not like where the body is, which is an adjudicative fact. So the argument is formal rulemaking isn't a good idea because most of what agencies are doing is making policy. So why are we going to cross-examine them about that? It's just not going to get us anything. Um, you need to wrap up. I'll wrap that up. Okay. Uh, I'm unpersuaded by that. Um, that strikes me as you know, vastly uh, over-inclusive. It's a question of degree and not kind. Um, of what's a legislative and adjudicative fact, and put that much weight on it, just just won't do the work. Um, another argument is that it just makes things take too long, um, which I think is is true. Um, but nonetheless, there might be times when it's worth it to spend a little bit more time. Um, you know, again, uh, I, I say the, the very high end of the regulatory universe, more procedure might be worth it. Often we trade um, efficiency um, for accuracy, and I think there might be a value there as well. Finally, there's questions about legitimacy, but we all know that trials are, are, are regarded as legitimate. So even if, in fact, we think it doesn't do us any better, you know, the experts say, ah, informal rulemaking, what, formal rulemaking, what a waste of time. Well, the public doesn't think a, a trial is a waste of time. They think it's valuable. And I think, if anything, which I, I think it does have value in it, but if not, it still itself would have value in adding legitimacy to the administrative process. So I argue that it's something worth considering going forward. We will now hear from Professor Merrill, and it should be noted that he knows more about administrative law than anyone else in the U United States. <laughs> yep. uh, don't tell, tell that to Peter Strauss, my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, great. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, preliminaries. One, one is I, th I think you maybe should say a little bit more about why formal rulemaking uh, was in the APA. Um, uh, the APA has a very odd definition of rule. Uh, it's not the common sense definition that a rule is sort of a general proposition of law that's, you know, binding on all persons who come within the uh, category of the rule. A rule is defined as a, uh, an agency statement of general or particular applicability and future effect. So uh, it's very odd. So you can have a very particular um, a rule that applies only to a single party, just as you can have a, an adjudication that applies only to a single party. And I think what the APA, why the AP is written that way is because uh, rate prescription orders that were uh, used in railroad rate making and also in other types of public utility rate making were thought to be uh, rules. They were thought to be prospective and therefore different from retrospective uh, reparations actions. And so the reason why we have formal rulemaking was to accommodate uh, uh, ICC and other types of administrative action that would both uh, adjudicate the reasonableness of a rate in the past and award reparations and also s prescribe a rate for the future for a particular carrier and a particular route. Um, and uh, that was subject to these formal procedures because e er, both the past and the present uh, with this respect to this particular rate were decided in a single proceeding. So I think that's the explanation for why we have uh, formal rulemaking in the APA. I agree with your critique of the of the Rehnquist opinion in Florida East Coast. It's it's unpersuasive, um, and it's unclear as to what was driving Rehnquist uh, uh, to read formal rulemaking out of the APA, uh, other than hostility to government uh, in general. Um, a little unclear. A lot of your arguments go to the uh, the invalidity of the Florida East Coast decision. Maybe we should, you know, the suggestion is sort of uh, you're on the cusp of suggesting that maybe we should overturn it and go back to the true meaning of the APA. But then you back away from that. You don't really want to do that. You just want to have these sort of pilot programs experimenting with uh, formal rulemaking going forward. Uh, if you're not going to overturn Florida East Coast, it seems to me that there are some uh, maybe other and better ideas than going back to formal rulemaking. Um, very quickly, uh, one uh, idea might be uh, reflected in something like the Federal Rules of Evidence and the Supreme Court's Daubert decision, which deals with um, uh, in technical questions uh, involving scientific uh, testimony and so forth. Uh, and the, the, there we haven't sort of gone into heavy cross-examination and the sort of traditional trial-type techniques. The em emphasis has been on what kind of experts can testify. Uh, 
uh, in a trial, and they have to, and the, the model that emerges is the scientific model, that the testimony has to be tested, it has to be peer-reviewed, it has to be published, it has to be falsifiable, it has to be uh, measured in terms of uh, potential rates of error. And it, it seems to me that if you wanted to reform rulemaking and make it, uh, you know, less political or something like that, you might want to push things in that direction, the model of sort of scientific decision-making rather than the model of Perry Mason and cross-examination. Another uh, point of comparison is OIRA review, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. It's been set up in the Reagan administration and perpetuated, which reviews these rules to see whether or not the uh, benefits of the rule exceed the cost. This is cost-benefit analysis. It's become very sophisticated. Now, that's another type of review of rulemaking or, or, or a type of constraint on rulemaking that might be more sensible than to uh, revert to trial techniques and, and cross-examination. If the concern is legitimacy, uh, which you talk about quite a bit. I'm, I'm not totally persuaded that in, in injecting trial techniques into rulemaking would enhance the legitimacy of rulemaking. I'm not sure the public is aware of rulemaking that much, or uh, if they are, whether they care uh, if there's been cross-examination or, or a closed record or things like that in the rulemaking. Uh, something like the RAINS Act, where you mandate that major rules be submitted to Congress under an expedited procedure that requires Congress to approve the rules. Uh, might do more to enhance the legitimacy of rulemaking uh, than reverting to um, uh, these sort of trial uh, techniques that are embodied in, in formal rulemaking. Lastly, um, uh, you say we need these pilot programs to set up some sort of experimental evidence about formal rulemaking, but in fact there are some formal rules uh, that are in existence. Some, some statutes have the magic words of on the record. Um, and uh, maybe we could try to do uh, some empirical studies looking at rulemaking under those small number of statutes that do exist and comparing it to other rules uh, and use existing law to do our experiment rather than creating a pilot program to do the experiment. Thank you. We'll now take questions uh, from the audience. I'll uh, begin just by asking uh, Professor Kent a question. I wonder whether the recent national security cases in the Supreme Court are affected in part by the ghost of Korematsu and the World War I uh, decisions on free speech, limiting freedom of speech. And I wonder whether the current court, particularly Justice Kennedy on the current court, uh, has tended to react in recent years out of a desire not to ratify emergency powers in cases that would be like Korematsu or the World War I. Uh, free speech cases. Any thoughts? Um, so I, I think I take the sort of underlying thrust of your question to be: Might there just be either, you know, personal or you know, just kind of a very specific uh, reasons why the cases came out they did, rather than um, you know, sort of larger concerns that the court has had over time about about the nature of remedies or the nature of litigation or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think a lot of uh, a lot of different things went into those. Decisions, uh, um, you know, probably o you know over overly aggressive legal arguments uh, in some cases by the Department of Justice, you know, Abu Ghraib happening when Rasul and, and Hamdi were uh, you know were being written. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that absolutely, and uh, I, I don't want to you know I, I don't want to be seen to be overstating this that you know these these opinions you know are only driven by uh, you know by by thoughts about remedies. I mean, I think. I think thoughts about remedies um, are often not actually front and center um, in in these decisions, in part because um, you know cases like Rasul or or Bumidian are very much you know, talking about habeas corpus, but the courts are not actually ordering release. I mean, they're not um, you know, they're not uh, they're not mandating that the remedy uh, actually be put into effect. And so, you know, I think at, at the Supreme Court level, at least, they're not like, grappling um, you know in that particular case with kind of you know, with, with the real with the real remedial mechanics, but you know, talking at a broader level about about law and policy. So yes, I mean, I think there's a lot a lot else going on besides just these remedial issues. Thanks. Yes. to have common law remedies of, of damages. Well, it's clearly the damages is saying, you did something wrong and now you should pay. 
and injunctive relief is much more compatible with a view of judges as, as was said in the 1970s, partners in the administrative process. We just want to help administrative agencies come to the right policy or the right result. And as partners, uh, we don't want to punish anyone. We don't even want to shame anyone. We just want to guide you, and that's what injunction does, which when you think of it, is itself a kind of administrative remedy. We don't allow regulatory agencies to collect fines. We say, oh, no, whoa, that would be taxes. That's scary. But we think it's fine for them to bully you, cajole you, coerce you, and force you to spend a lot of money. But they just do it by something that's analogous to injunction. And so judges doing the same thing think the same way. So maybe this is reflecting something deep about the way the administrative state changes, the way we think about courts. And that captures really quite a lot of what you're talking about. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is one of the things about this project. I, I mean, I think this is a completely overdetermined issue where there's a, a whole lot of, uh, of different explanations, and I've, I've only focused on some of them. Um, I, I mean, uh, your description of the sort of, sort of the, the attitude, the judicial attitude, strikes me as, as correct. Um, I mean, I think you often do see courts, or at least kind of feel under the surface of a, of a judicial decision. Um, some reluctance to be doing what they seem to think is is, is blaming. Um, you know, the suits are, even if the person's identified and defended by the government, the suits are against the officer personally. Um, and often, you know, indemnification only happens after judgment is entered uh, and it's not guaranteed. So, um, you know, I think judges are, are aware of the fact, aware that they actually might, in fact, be, you know, entering a judgment against a, a person that, that, you know, he or she will pay personally. Um, and, Yes, I mean, I, I, you know, part of uh, part of talking about uh, kind of this, this huge inversion of remedies over time um, uh, is uh, it's a story about about I think changing judicial attitude towards um, you know their role with the government. I mean, when you know jury trials, uh, excuse me, you know damages trials are, are primarily going to be you know going to a jury, and, and you know almost all coercive remedies are going to be tried to the court. And I think it's you know it's not accidental that you know over time judges have uh, become. Uh, you know, have, have wanted to, uh, you know, to be uh, having these cases come up in a posture where, uh, you know, all the important decisions, including the fact finding, are, are things that are going to, uh, you know, that they're going to be done by themselves because I think they do see themselves as kind of standard setters and sort of partners in, in almost, you know, sort of constitutional legislation. Yeah, I mean, uh, the traditional notion of courts was that they were enforcing established norms against people that had deviated from those norms. So if you breach a contract or you commit a tort or you violate someone's property rights, uh, then the court rectifies that and many frequently does so by awarding damages. Uh, uh, the modern notion uh, in the law and economics fraternity, for example, is that, well, damages are to deter people to make them to behave differently. And, you know, let's just use damages as another uh, technique for changing uh, social behavior. Uh, but I think courts are very uncomfortable with that. I think uh, they do see themselves as changing norms uh, and, and as uh, making law. Uh, but it's much cleaner and less messy to do so by issuing injunctions and declaratory orders uh, uh, rather than sort of setting up some kind of draconian damages regime against the government in order to get the government to change uh, its behavior through uh, the internalization of, of the costs. Uh, um, but I, I still, it is an interesting mystery, yeah. Yes, Marty. Yes, this is a question um, for Robert Leader. Um, and it, it goes to the, the issues raised by Mr. Merrill about methodology. Um, it, uh, it, Mr. Merrill seemed to interpret you as not making much of a textualist case at all and, and instead was relying on more of an intentionalist or structuralist approach um, and suggested that you know, the concerns that you point to were so historically embedded uh, that you know the normative case for relying on that kind of approach was not strong with respect to this issue. It sounded to me, though, at least with respect to militia, as though you were making kind of an open public meaning argument. And so I was wondering if you could speak to those methodological questions. Yeah, so I, I think the paper does a little bit of both. Uh, the power to raise armies, if you look at it as a pure textualist provision uh, has no limitation except as to the appropriations uh, limit. And so from that aspect, I do think that the paper is taking very much a structuralist approach. O on the other hand, uh, on the 
discussion about the Army Reserve, I think that goes a little bit more towards original public meaning because it ties into what the term Army meant uh, to the framers. And my argument, you know, is that Army meant, you know, ar armies were comprised of regular troops. And I, that to me is not a structuralist argument at all. It's a public meaning argument. And it's just, you know, that's how the framers would have distinguished regular forces and militia. If I could, is the United States Air Force unconstitutional then? I don't think so. Uh, Judge, uh, this comes up, uh, yeah. I, I, I don't think it is. I think the, I, I, I think the argument that it is um, confuses a little bit what armies meant. I, I don't think that just because we put a label on it of an Air Force that it can't be an army within the meaning of the Constitution. The Air Force is, uh, the Air Force might dispute this, but I think their primary, their primary objective is to provide ground, you know, to provide air power in support of the army because air power by itself uh, doesn't accomplish very much. And so I think in some level, it, you know, I think in so, I think it, originally, in fact, the army, the Air Force was a part of the army. In World War II, they were the Army Air Forces. And so I don't think that the um, bureaucratic separation of the Air Force into its own department suddenly transforms it from providing military support for ground troops to uh, its own unconstitutional have, organization. Have you had a chance to look into the debates in Congress during the War of 1812 over whether to institute a draft? I gather one was proposed and there was opposition to it on constitutional grounds. Yes. Or the debates when President Lincoln imposed the draft during the Civil War. Yeah. So on both of the original drafts, the issue was hotly contested. Uh, Daniel Webster gave a very famous speech against the draft, arguing that the draft is basically collapsing the uh, army. And, and um, I, I, Congress ultimately didn't accept that. Uh, Congress didn't institute a draft in the War of 1812, but it was because uh, the House and the Senate couldn't reconcile differing provisions over the length of service. Uh, but it, it, during the Civil War, the issue heated up again. The only case that really comes out of the Civil War is the 1863 Pennsylvania decision called Needler versus Lane, where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court originally struck down the draft as unconstitutional. One of the justices left the court, and then the court reversed itself 3-2 the other way and upheld the draft. So, uh, you know, and I do think uh, at the framing, whether the draft was constitutional or not was actually a fairly close question. Washington had proposed the draft during uh, the Revolutionary War. I, I mean, I think it, you know, I think overall it, uh, the evidence leans that it's unconstitutional, but I do think it's actually a fairly difficult question. Question in the back there, behind you. Uh, my question is to uh, Professor Nielsen <coughs> regarding regulations. Uh, First off, uh, the assumption that the agencies don't look at the, regu uh, at the commentary, uh, I can speak to two uh, specific agencies, the IRS and the SEC, and they do take those comments. In fact, in preambles to their regulations, they will cite many times what the comments were with respect to those regulations, uh, both temp three types, temporary, proposed, and, f and final, and they go through a series of uh, reiterations uh, many times. Therefore, taking uh, Professor Merrill's point, I think litigation in this context could be create a, 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 an, a, a, an unintended consequence, a reverse effect, because you'd be trying to anticipate everything out there in advance of what might happen in cases uh, occurring associated with the subject matter of those regulations rather than allowing the litigation process itself to take care of what we would call um, issues that are not ripe but issues that are now ripe for regulation because there is in fact a case of controversy before the court to address those regulations. Uh, either, uh, either one of you could address sure. that point. No, of course I mean, if, if you look at a final rule, they're going to go through and take the material, the comments they call material, and, and say this is what they said, and th th they're checking off a box. But w we all know there's a difference between reading to learn and reading to read. 
Um, and they often, at least in my experiences, you know, drafting these letters on commentary on behalf of clients is they, they, they're not reading what we're sending them because they don't actually want to know what we have to say. I disagree um, because I personally had them take that into account and change various regulations based on that. You're, based, a, be, you're a better advocate than I am, I guess. But um, it, may, I, it may be the tax and the securities uh, agencies are uh, addressing this differently than the agencies you looked at. Uh, that's, sure. Uh, it's personal experience. But, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, that's necessarily empirically... Uh, 100% proof. But, but in any event, it's still the black box problem is still there because you don't know exactly how they how they went about deciding how much weight to give your comment or or if, or if at all they could say, I mean, for instance, they might have changed the rule. I don't know the particular instances of your of your case, but they might have changed the rule not because of anything that you said, um, because they said, oh, we don't want to have litigation about this. So there's some guy out there, we're going to change the rule. Um, so. That's the point. We don't know exactly what went through the reasoning process um, with, with a black box process like informal rulemaking, which most of the time I think is, is the necessary evil. Um, my point is there just might be times when it's just a pure evil. But, but, but what about the point we, that Professor well, Merrill the, you know, the question is a comparative one. Of, if, if you think agencies are totally uh, pre-committed to a particular policy um, and you want to try to change that somehow, is it more likely to change uh, the agency's behavior if they have to respond to all material comments that are proposed by interested groups or if their experts are subject to cross-examination at some kind of hearing? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I, to me, it seems implausible to think that the threat of cross-examination is going to be more likely to change agencies that have kind of bullheaded notions about things than, uh, than the duty to respond to comments subject to judicial review for the adequacy of the response. Okay, I think we're running a little over time, so we should take a short break now for five minutes, and then we'll resume with the final two papers. Thank you. What's the subject? Redressive justice. Um, all right. Uh, I was going to set a timer, but maybe you could just let me know when I... I, I, I have a timer going. Okay. Um, so this is a philosophical paper about the theory of justice. Uh, what, I, what I do in the paper, what I'd like to do in the presentation is sort of set forth a philosophical puzzlement and then a philosophical uh, proposal in solution to that puzzlement and, uh, and then draw certain jurisprudential implications from that philosophy. Uh, it's a tall order for 10 minutes. So I'll have to do this in a sort of under-argued way. I'll have to indicate a lot without fully defending it. So I hope you'll forgive that, that uh, problem in the presentation. Uh, let me start with a puzzle bit. So in the contemporary tradition of the theory of justice, or the, uh, largely the Rawlsian tradition, the tradition uh, not necessarily of Rawls himself, but of him and his followers, or those inspired by him, there are two central concerns organizing the activity of theorizing. Uh, one of those concerns is with uh, uh, shoring up the grounds, understanding the foundation of certain basic civil rights, like the right to vote, or social or political equality, or the right to free speech, or the right to free exercise, etc. Um, providing philosophical groundwork for those basic civil rights. The other organizing concern is for uh, uh, defining uh, what shares of social wealth uh, individuals in the community ought to have, so defining proper shares of social wealth. This combination, so the latter is distributive justice, and this concern for distributive justice and civil rights in conjunction uh, is basically the equation that gives you Rawls's term, which has become now the canonical term of the field, social justice. Social justice, at least I would argue, it's, this is an interpretive argument, social justice is the conjunction of dis, uh, distributive justice and some subset of civil rights. Um, Rawls, to speak of him as an example, Rawls tells us that people behind a veil of ignorance will arrange institutions to provide for certain rights and material shares. And he takes himself to be uh, advocating principles that should govern uh, the basic structure of society with regard to those things. So in so doing, he distinguishes ideal theory from non-ideal theory. 
uh, these are terms of art in the Rawlsian literature. Ideal theory is the body of theory that defines principles, I'm qu quoting now, principles of justice that would govern a well-ordered society in which everyone is presumed to act justly. And non-ideal theory governs the part of the theory of justice which has to do with people acting wrongly, things like uh, punishment theory, for example. Rawls argues that the fundamental part of a theory of justice is the ideal theoretic part. Uh, you can think of Rawls as offering a painting of a perfectly just world. And then the, so he takes the task of a theory of justice to be drawing the right painting, um, showing us what a perfectly just world would look like. And then, and then what the theorist does with respect to the real world is say, try to resemble that more closely. Try to look more like this painting. Um, wrongdoing and the response to wrongdoing is necessarily excluded from this theoretical structure. I mean excluded by fiat insofar as non-ideal theory is set apart from the theoretical structure. But what's puzzling is that to use the, the concept of justice to talk about wrongdoing and the proper response to wrongdoing is an entrenched way of using the concept. When some person A wrongs person B, let's say steals from him, or just negligently loses uh, person B's property, uh, we say it would be unjust to let that wrong stand. Justice requires, say, compensation for the negligent loss or punishment for the stealing. Uh, justice is conceptually linked to the redress of wrongdoing. And so there's this vivid sense, I think particularly for lawyers who encounter the Rawlsian literature, of something missing from that literature. Some a set of concerns that are too deep, too native, too important to justice to be left out, being quite deliberately left out. So here's, so what I, I, the puzzlement is, we seem to have two parts to a theory of justice. One part is the definition of what the painting should look like, the description of what an ideal, ideally just society should look like. And on the other hand, we have um, a system of norms to govern wrong, the redress of wrongdoing. How do those two parts fit together? Um, well, here's my proposal, moving on to part two of my presentation, here's my philosophical proposal. It's in the nature of norms that they can be violated. I mean, that's what makes them norms and not laws of nature. The norms are all such as to be violable. A peculiarity of norms of justice is that their violation requires redress. Norms of courtesy don't necessarily work that way. I mean, cur courtesy is a normative system. Good manners is a normative system. But there isn't necessarily a need for redress if I chew with my mouth open. Norms of living a good life don't necessarily require redress. So that's also a normative structure. We say, if you want to live a good life, you should invest yourself in productive work and, and family, uh, for example. Uh, but if one doesn't, there's no redress to be had. It might just be a mistake. Uh, Norms of reasoning. Reasoning is also a normative activity. Norms of reasoning, like that if your views are inconsistent, you should revise them, also don't come with redress of demands. But the norms of justice, these norms that govern interpersonal moral wrong, uh, right and wrongdoing, uh, do characteristically require redress when violated. Um, if you think of the norms of justice as characteristically requiring redress when violated, you can start to separate the norms of justice into two sets. Uh, there's a first set which specify what we might call primary rights, and then a second set specifying what to do when norms of the first set are violated. So for example, let's say I have a, a property right to this pen. You could say I have a primary property right to this pen. Uh, what if Andrew should take this pen from me? Well, you could say I have a right to compensation. Maybe I have a right to restitution. I have the right to my pen back. Or I have a right to compensation for property that was wrongfully taken. Here's what's interesting about that distinction between the first right and the second right. Um, with regard to the second right, my right to restitution for property wrongfully taken from me, it is a condition of the thinkability of that norm uh, uh, that there be a previous right that was violated. So unless you have the thought of a, the violation of some right to this pen, you can't have the further thought that there is a right to restitution for this pen having been wrongfully taken. On the other hand, the right to this pen itself does not require the, for its conceptualization, does not require that, the, uh, that any wrong have been committed. 
you can conceptualize the right to the pen without any thought of a wrong. So you, could, you start to have a, a principle of distinction, a principle for sorting the familiar norms of justice into two camps. You have one camp, uh, the right to trial, the right to restitution, uh, the demand for punishment of wrongdoing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for which a prior wrong is a condition of its thinkability. And you have a, another set for which no prior wrong is a condition of its thinkability. The right to vote doesn't require the thought of violation for its thinkability. Um, let me an, uh, clarify this with an analogy uh, to um, uh, sports. I mean, sports are many normative systems. The rules of a sport are, is a many normative system. So think about the rules of, of basketball. There are some norms specifying how to play the game without committing fouls. For example, don't run while carrying the ball. You've got to dribble. That's a norm defining how the game is to be played. On the other hand, there are uh, norms governing what to do when the first set of norms are violated. So if somebody does run while carrying the ball, give the other team free throws or take the ball out of bounds and transfer it to the other team. Those two norms are different in kind. The one requires the thought of the violation of the other. The first doesn't require the idea of uh, any violation at all. Um, now let me offer a more substantively rich uh, um, analogy to see how these two things play out in practice. In 1949, Germany established a new constitution. Uh, it was a liberal democratic constitution. And let's, for the sake of argument, stipulate that it established what for all would be a just basic structure. It gave people their proper rights, and it gave them their pro proper material shares. Stipulate that for the moment. From a Rawlsian perspective, there's nothing left for justice to do. As long as the Constitution is effective so that people are given the rights uh, in the Constitution, um, Rawls's theory would be blind to anything required by justice which is left undone after 1949 in Germany. But of course, the story of Germany is also the story of reparations and prosecutions of war criminals and lawsuits by survivors. What strikes me, what I'm trying to illuminate, is how both sides of that equation, the establishment of a just constitution and the lawsuits, reparations, and prosecutions are two parts of what justice required in Germany after the Third Reich. And the, the Rawlsian tradition is blind to the second part. Uh, you're running out of time. Uh, I'll wrap up with the jurisprudential implications as I see them. If you separate a theory of justice into primary and redressive parts, as I have argued it should be, it seems to me that the redressive part of a theory of justice gives us some purchase on what it is legal systems peculiarly con are concerned with and do. Let's start with this fact. Every complaint, every indictment, is an allegation of wrongdoing and a demand for redress. I mean, these are forms in which, uh, architecturally, the allegation of wrongdoing and the demand for redress go. And that is to say that the activity of a legal system, by which I mean not just all laws whatsoever, many of which define primary rights, obviously, uh, the activity of a, of a system of courts and lawyers, prosecutors, litigants, and so on, is a system for redressing wrongs, is a system for securing redress of justice. Um, I think that is why lawyers feel so often alienated from the Rawlsian tradition of the theory of justice. It's actually peculiar that there should be a vast and impressive body of theoretical work on justice uh, from which lawyers whose enterprise is centrally concerned with justice feel alienated and excluded. That's puzzling. That's a puzzling fact that requires explanation. Uh, and I'm trying to give some account of why that might be so. But the bigger thought, and the one I'll close on, uh, is, is this. Uh, if we ask ourselves what it means to live under a concept, it means to some extent that we organize social institutions to effectuate certain kinds of uh, um, uh, operations that the concept requires of us. Right, so if, if justice is a concept that, that separates, for necessary reasons, uh, for inferential reasons, into two parts, one of which is redressive, we should expect to find in a society committed to justice uh, social systems for uh, achieving the ends of both parts of justice. And I think we do uh, see in the legal system, we start to see it as 
a system for organized around the values of redress of justice. Professor Mayo. Okay, so um, I guess my comments are not necessarily a criticism as much as maybe an elaboration, but um, I, I, I found this distinction between primary and redress of justice quite helpful. Uh, I think from a lawyer's perspective, particularly a common law lawyer's perspective, um, redressive justice seems to be playing an even larger role than perhaps your, uh, your depiction uh, suggests. Uh, let me give you two examples of why I think this. One is from the law of property, particularly the law of property as it developed uh, in England um, uh, uh, some centuries ago. Um, one would not uh, go to court and say, I have property in this pen, and Joshua you know, took my property. One would say, uh, he took my thing, and I want my thing back. Uh, and the courts uh, would not inquire into who owned the pen. They would simply inquire you know, uh, whether or not I had possession of the pen before you had possession of the pen. And then if Andrew takes the pen, uh, uh, you know, we can have yet another dispute between you and Andrew as to who had the pen first and, and, uh, and who has the right to the pen. So it was entirely a series of, uh, there was no uh, inquiry into the right of property. It was simply whether or not uh, uh, it was entirely relational uh, uh, concept as to uh, who had a superior claim as between the A and B that were uh, in dispute with each other uh, over the pen. You could say that was a right of possession as opposed to a right of ownership, uh, but nevertheless there was no focus really on the right question but rather on the priority question. Uh, and only after a period of time when you've had a sequence of these sort of actions do people begin to generalize and say that maybe the person who trumps everyone else has some kind of superior right that we might call a right against the world as opposed to merely a, a series of relational rights in which uh, one person trumps another person. Torts is somewhat similar. Um, I can uh, violate your rights by engaging in an extremely reckless action. I could speed down Broadway at 95 miles an hour and uh, interfere with everyone's rights uh, by imposing uh, undue risks on them. Uh, but nevertheless, the law would do nothing unless somebody was actually injured physically uh, by my reckless behavior. And so you would go to court and claim he injured me. Uh, uh, you wouldn't say I have a, a primary right to bodily integrity and, and, and now I'm seeking redress for that uh, because uh, this right has been invaded by somebody else. You'd say he injured me. And then the question would be, did in fact you cause the injury? And if that gets resolved, then the question would be, were you uh, engaging in negligent or reckless behavior? Um, and then, interestingly enough, the defendant can claim that the plaintiff was uh, contributorily negligent, uh, which raises further pu puzzles as to why a plaintiff would be subject to a duty to themselves to behave in a non-negligent way. And the litigation would basically proceed by asking who was more at fault or who was more egregiously at fault uh, for this particular injury, not trying to sort of define in some abstract sense a set of primary rights that were needed to be redressed. Uh, by any particular person. So I, I think the distinction is a good one, but I think if you look at the history, at least of English and American law, the redressive uh, perspective is, uh, has sort of temporal priority, and it's only uh, abstract thinkers who look at the situation after a period of time that can begin to generalize to what sort of implicit primary rights are, are being uh, uh, recognized by the system, and the system operates primarily through a system of redress in which uh, courts uh, are, do not feel comfortable articulating this as a primary right, redress of primary right sort of system. It's just sort of like, you know, under our system, do you get redress or not? And, and then philosopher types can sort of look at that, start asking whether or not there are primary rights there. Yeah, so I agree with that. I actually think this is, um, there is a fascinating distinction between conceptual priority and heuristic priority here. So a lot of our basic rights were discovered by way of their violation. They're sort of uncovered in the course of objecting to the violation. Uh, we don't necessarily start from the idea that all human beings are equal. We might start from the idea that slavery is wrong and reach the, and then we might get an additional idea that um, women not having the right to vote is wrong. And uh, an additional idea, um, uh, racial groups being denied equal civil status is wrong. And then in the philosopher types or, or political activist type types might say, 
conceptually we could see that all of these objections to certain kinds of wrongdoing emanate from some organizing principle, namely a right of equality. So I think it's often by way of violation that we decide what our rights are. But that's a heuristic fact because it's still a con the conceptual. We, we have to move on. Um, Professor Merrill, did you want to say anything more? No, 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 no. Okay. I thought Let, I was responding to you. <laughs> you, you were, but we're, we need to do that during the question and answer period. No. Uh, Professor Ozan Varrell will now speak about uh, temporary constitutions for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Calabresi. And uh, I apologize for having missed the previous papers on the panel I was presenting um, across the street. I don't know if this is hot or not. It is. So uh, the title of my paper is Temporary Constitutions is forthcoming in a few months in the California Law Review. Um, in the article, I discuss both the benefits and the costs of temporary constitutions and, and provide prescriptions for their optimal use. I'll start with a basic definition first. A temporary constitution refers to either an, an entire constitution or a specific constitutional provision that sets an expiration date for itself and lapses at its expiration date unless it's reenacted through regular um, constitutional amendment procedures. Temporary constitutions can be especially useful for th three purposes, which I'll go, um, go through in this talk. And the end goal in the use of temporary constitutionalism is to create a more durable and a more optimal constitution that incorporates the benefits that have been generated from the use of a temporary provision um, for an interim period. And to be sure, temporary constitutions are not inevitably preferable over other design alternatives. They're simply a, a tool in a constitutional designer's toolbox to be deployed at the appropriate moment. Um, they can impose their own costs as well. And in the article, I, I analyze those costs and, and offer ideas for minimizing them. So let me start with the first purpose, which is reducing cognitive biases, which are biases that tend to get in the way of rational decision making in, in writing a new constitution. I started thinking about this article as I followed um, and wrote uh, about the ongoing transition process in Egypt, which by most accounts has been quite abysmal. Um, there is a, a joke among comparative constitutionalists now that if you want to terrify people who are writing a new democratic constitution in a, in a foreign country, just walk into their constitution drafting assembly and say, I'm from Egypt and I'm here to help you draft your constitution. Um, and I'll say this though, and I, I think this point is lost on many commentators, many transitions look like the Egyptian transition. Um, revolutions are glorified in the, the academic and popular commentary as these opportune moments for writing a durable constitution. Uh, there are supposed to be moments of greater altruism, moments above the, the, the daily sort of short-sighted, self-interested political life. That thesis, although appealing in principle, I think neglects the empirical reality that many transitions tend not to be very optimal moments for, for writing a new constitution because they tend to be dominated by cognitive biases. Um, I'll mention two of them. Um, under the availability bias or the availability heuristic, recent events tend to have greater salience than earlier ones. So for example, studies show that people tend to buy earthquake insurance more frequently in the aftermath of a major earthquake. Um, they overestimate the probability of, of an earthquake happening again and they go out and buy insurance even if they may not need to. Revolutions generate their own set of earthquakes in the form of uh, turbulence, chaos, conflict, social and economic instability, uh, violence, and sometimes a full-blown civil war. And policymakers and citizens in these post-revolutionary moments may overestimate and overreact to newly recognized threats, however unlikely their recurrence may be. And a durable constitution drafted in these post-revolutionary moments may tend to reflect an overarching focus on the immediate short-term needs of maintaining national unity and stability at the expense of other constitutional goals. So the preventive detention uh, provisions in the Indian Constitution are a good example of this. The Indian Constitution was drafted after the end of British colonialism at a particular turbulent period in, in Indian history marked with, by an armed rebellion and, and, uh, and conflict with, with Pakistan. And, um, and although the British had used preventive detention as a tool for tyranny, the Indian constitutional drafters decided to protect pre preventive detention in the, in the new constitution and rejected due process protections for detainees on the basis that preventive detention was a necessary evil in this conflict-filled moment in Indian history. But the placement of those provisions in a durable constitution allowed government officials decades later to use them to suppress opposition. I'll also mention the status quo bias, which uh, tends to affect nations in transition from one regime type to the other, so for example, from dictatorship to democracy. Revolutions often produce outbreaks of nostalgia, 
um, in the, 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 the social and political turmoil that a democratic transition produces, many sort of wistfully harken back to the, the stable days of the authoritarian regime. And we're seeing that in the countries emerging from the Arab Spring. As revolution fatigue sweeps over the country, these old autocratic institutional structures appear to look normatively desirable over democratic alternatives. So according to a Pew Global Research poll in August 2013, 80% um, of, of Egyptians believe that the country is worse off following Mubarak's ouster. And the status quo bias may create opportunities for powerful groups to capture the constitutional design process, to stack the constitutional deck in their favor, and force a rebound to the earlier regime type. And a durable constitution that's drafted in, in these moments when the status quo bias is running high may etch into stone some anti-democratic constitutional provisions that might be very difficult to remove later. And there are plenty of examples of this, including Russia, Venezuela, Belarus, and, and Kazakhstan. So a, a temporary constitution may be an appropriate cure for the temporary passions that dominate some of these constitutional moments. To reduce cognitive biases, a temporary constitution may be adopted to remain in place for a few years to allow transitional passions to settle and achieve economic, social, and institutional stability before a more durable document is, is drafted. Uh, temporary constitutions can provide the, the opportunity for a sober second thought on the initial constitutional judgment, and they may also allow, for the time, uh, allow time for the formation of organized political parties and an effective political marketplace. And one of the reasons why the Muslim Brotherhood was, was able to dominate the first constitution-making process in Egypt was because the elections and the constitution-making process occurred so quickly um, and did not provide sufficient time for the new parties to organize and mount an electoral campaign. And with an effective opposition and a more informed public, the constitutional drafters may be less likely and able to stack the constitutional deck in their favor. So the constitutional drafters in South Africa and Poland, for example, successfully used temporary constitutions to negotiate their transitions to more pluralistic democracies. The second purpose is constitutional incrementalism. Uh, a durable constitution, particularly one with a difficult amendment rule, can impose enormous error costs, which refer to the gap between the expected outcome of a policy and its actual outcome. A, a constitutional provision may be appealing in theory, but may turn out to be unworkable in practice or produce undesirable substantive outcomes. Um, in contrast, the error costs of entrenching a norm in a, in a temporary constitution are relatively low. So when constitutional designers sit down to write a new constitution and they're uncertain about the long-term consequences of a constitutional policy, the use of a temporary provision can reduce error costs because any errors at time one, the drafting moment, may be fixed more easily at time two uh, when the temporary provision is revisited. And during that interim period, you can also gather empirical evidence um, about the, the effects of the constitutional norms that were adopted in the abstract at time one to allow for a more meaningful decision-making process at, at time two. Now, none of that is to say, of course, that incrementalism and experimentation must always be preferred. If the constitutional designers have adequate information, they're reasonably confident in their normative preferences, then they can take larger and more durable constitutional leaps. And finally, consensus building. So, Constitutional design is often a delicate exercise in consensus building because it often takes place between groups with competing visions for the document who disagree and do so passionately um, on, on its content. And although you need some passion to jumpstart the constitutional design process, excessive passion can make consensus building extremely difficult, especially on controversial provisions. The durable nature of the Constitution adds even more pressure to the design process because once a provision is entrenched in a durable constitution, then its uh, opponents will bear the heavy burden of amending it. And faced with the possibility of such a burden, the, the, uh, the opponents may hold out during the constitutional design process, undermining the prospects of a bargain on the constitution. And at times, conflict over constitutional choices may derail the entire design process. So the constitutional design process in Egypt under the Muslim Brotherhood prompted mass resignations by the, by the non-Islamist members of the Constituent Assembly. And even if ratification is possible without the support of a critical minority, a constitution that's not a consensus document may create significant political problems in the long term, and Egypt is another example of this. The, the constitution-making process that was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood served to further, further polarize the country and galvanizing millions um, to rally against the Brotherhood and pr prompting another military intervention in July 2013. So to ensure a, a constitutional 
consensus, it may be necessary to resort to a second best solution, which is to include one formulation of the contested provision, but make it temporary. The temporary nature of the contested provision may mollify, at least to some extent, the opponents of the provision who fear that its placement in a durable document is going to make it impossible to remove thereafter. And on the other hand, the proponents of the provision may think, correctly or incorrectly, that they're going to have sufficient political power uh, to reenact the provision when the sunset date arrives. And by taking the issue off the bargaining table, the use of a temporary provision may prevent the derailment of the design process. So the U.S. Constitution actually contains a, a temporary provision that was included specifically for the purpose of building a consensus. Article 1, Section 9 prohibited Congress from banning the slave trade for 20 years. For the slaveholding South, the federal commerce power in the new Constitution presented a, a major risk because the commerce power could reasonably permit Congress to regulate and prohibit the domestic and foreign slave trade. And so Georgia, North Carolina, and South Carolina expressly declared that they would not ratify the Constitution and would not join the Union if Congress would have the authority to prohibit the importation of slaves. So if there was to be a union, this rift between the proponents and the opponents of the slave trade had to be solved, and the solution was to temporarily prohibit Congress from banning the slave trade for 20 years. In exchange, the southern states agreed to emit a provision that would have required a two-thirds majority in Congress to enact a law regulating commerce. Now, of you course... You need to wrap up, okay. I'm afraid. So the temporary provision, of course, didn't end the institution of, of slavery it took a disastrous civil war and a, and a reconstruction for that to happen. At the same time, though, the southern states had refused to enter the Union without temporary pr permission of the slave trade. So the failure to reach a compromise on that question may have meant that there wouldn't be a Union, and if the parties had been unable to compromise, the Articles of Confederation would have remained in effect, and the slave trade would have continued indefinitely because the Articles required unanimous agreement. Uh, by all state legislatures to alter any of these provisions. And I'll stop there. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Professor Merrill. Okay, I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, first, uh, it's just a question really as to whether you want to do more or less in terms of comparing uh, temporary constitutions as you define them with other ways of achieving constitutional change. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, every constitution is temporary uh, in reality. Uh, you know, you can. Uh, interpret it uh, differently, you can amend it, and so forth. And so um, I kept thinking throughout reading the paper about, and you do discuss this to some extent, how some of these uh, mechanisms for change compare with what I think you're talking about, which is having an explicit time limit on the Constitution uh, uh, as a device for uh, 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 treating some of these uh, problems you discuss. But obviously, amendments and so forth can also handle, can also achieve incrementalism and overcome some of these heuristic problems that you're talking about. I guess my advice would be to, to emphasize that you're, you're only discussing this one narrow mechanism and, and not avoid, and avoid getting this thing uh, to proliferate into a general theory of constitution making. A uh, second point is I think uh, it might be useful for you to look more into the literature on sunset laws. Uh, uh, in the United States, we've experimented from time to time with laws that explicitly have uh, sunset provisions in them. Uh, you may mention, I think, the independent counsel statute as an example of this. That's about the only example I'm aware of that really has a happy story uh, <laughs> associated with it. Um, uh, and it was somewhat fortuitous, you know, the uh, Democrats uh, independently decided that maybe independent counsels weren't such a good idea after the Clinton impeachment. and. Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, did away with the independent counsel statutes. Before that, it had been, uh, I think, reenacted, was it twice, Steve? Twice, yeah. yeah. Um, other sunset laws have a much grimmer uh, story. Uh, uh, one that I know about is the, con the consumer, uh, uh, CFTC, the consumer, uh, what is it called, the uh, Finance, uh, com com the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. <laughs> Uh, had a, has a sunset provision in its, uh, in its organic act, and uh, after there was some discussion when it first came up for renewal, but after that it's just been rubber stamped without any significant discussion, and the basic uh, analysis of this by political scientists is that, you know, once you create a bureaucracy and once you create vested interests that are, are advanced by having this agency, uh, they will connive to make sure that the agency is continually perpetuated, and uh, that sort of dynamic dominates any sort of independent reflection about whether or not the agency makes sense and it should be put out of its misery and so forth. And so um, some of that empirical literature on sunset statutes might uh, shape some of your uh, commentary about sunsetting constitutions. Lastly, and as maybe others in the room know more about this than I do, 
My impression was that the uh, slave importation issue was, to a significant degree, a dispute between different slaveholding states, uh, that some of them, uh, uh, like you know, Virginia and so forth, that had lots of slaves, uh, might have been in favor of eliminating the, at least the international slave trade, because that would increase the value of their slaves, and others uh, in, in the frontier regions and so forth were uh, opposed to that. And so it, it's not so much, uh, as you characterize it, a dispute between the incipient abolitionists in the North and the uh, Southerners who hold slaves as perhaps an intramural dispute uh, between two factions of the slave slaveocracy, but that's just my impression. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bretschneider? Uh, Did you get the microphone? I don't know where it is. So that Um, thanks. I wanted to go back to the uh, exchange between uh, Tom and, and Josh and just to see um, if I could offer a third way, perhaps a third way forward, or it might, I, I think it's sympathetic with some of what you gestured to. So, I mean, I love the question, which is, what's the role of ideal theory in thinking about remedies? And then you encounter, I think, the important counter response, which is, well, if you look at the doctrine, it doesn't look like it's about ideal theory. And I think that's particularly obvious in property, right, where if it was about ideal theory, we'd be talking almost exclusively about distribution of wealth and the proper distribution of wealth. And it looks like the logic, as you say, isn't there in the, in the case law, either historically or arguably now. But I guess my question is, isn't there a third way for you forward, and maybe you're gesturing at this in a in longer paper, which is to say, uh, remedies and uh, property law, for instance, aren't ab about ideal theory, but they're about improvement and gesturing towards something that's better than the previous state of affairs. So the remedy always has to fix, regardless of the point of time that we're at, the previous regime. And then I would think you have a way forward, which is to say, now how do we navigate whether something is an improvement or not? And the answer might be, uh, that we need ideal theory. So I, I don't know, I'm offering that as a possible third way forward that uh, law is not ideal theory, but it's got a gesture towards. And that's consistent with a lot of the work I think that's being done in ideal theory now, which says, look, there's always an improvement uh, you know, relative to a previous state of affairs. And in order to see whether the improvement is there, we need ideal theory. So does that make, I guess the question is, does that satisfy both of you? Does it make you friends? Is that the third <laughs> way forward or neither of you? Um, should I answer that or should you? Let me talk, I'll say something quickly. Um, I think distributive justice uh, is very, very difficult to implement through any system of redress of uh, wrongs. Uh, uh, I mean, people have occasionally suggested that the wealth of the defendant should be relevant in whether or not, you know, you get just compensation for takings of property or perhaps, you know, the size of the damages you pay should be adjusted according to whether you're rich or poor and so forth. And um, these go nowhere because of the accidents of who sues whom under what circumstances and so forth. It would result in a completely haphazard uh, system of uh, distribution that wouldn't satisfy any conception of justice. So in, insofar as modern philosophy and, and modern you know, thought increasingly is obsessed with distributive justice, it seems to me that it becomes harder and harder to uh, think of that through the lens of sort of traditional corrective justice sort of uh, models. What I, what I would want to add is, uh, is, is, is that I think uh, courts, in trying to do redress of justice, characteristically clarify our primary rights. So it's not that courts uh, are occupied with redress of justice and therefore inert or orthogonal with regard to primary justice or primary rights. It's rather that um, the activity of redress is always uh, a question of trying to secure something, and the thing they're trying to secure is a um, is a primary right of some kind. And so there's a continual process by which courts contribute to the clarification of our primary rights. The, the other thing I would say is that I don't, uh, you, you talked about uh, making uh, uh, t Tom and I friends with your <laughs> third way, um, but, but even intellectually, I didn't see us as opposed or his comment is really an objection. It just seems to me that there is a conceptual priority between primary and redress of justice in which redress of justice is necessarily secondary to a primary. The primary rights have to be specified for the, for the uh, uh, redress of ones to be conceived. 
And then there's a historical, or what I was calling a heuristic priority. They're not the same priority. I take that to be a very interesting fact, but not an objection. Can I raise a different objection? And that is um, the pursuit of justice by individuals or societies is a virtue, but there are other virtues too, uh, wisdom, temperance, courage, um, and arguably pursuing all the virtues leads to human flourishing. Why focus on the virtue of justice and not on other virtues when uh, an exclusive focus on the virtue of justice may be immoderate or lead to cowardice or be uh, intemperate? Okay. Uh, so Rawls says one of Rawls's most important contributions was to center political philosophy on the theory of justice, to say that the central issue of political philosophy is, is the theory of justice. Uh, I agree entirely with Steve that that was an unfortunate simplification of a very complex realm of human goods, one of which is justice. The other thing Rawls said in, in sort of arguing that the um, right trumps the good is that the theory of justice would trump any contrary um, uh, concern that might be put forward, including wisdom or yeah, even flourishing, although he would think that um, justice is necessarily or always congenial to flourishing, I think. Um, my own, my own view is that he was wrong both about the priority of justice and about justice being the exclusive concern of political philosophy. But I also think he had a, a partial view of justice. And so I'm interested in carving out space for justice as lawyers experience it. Yes, Marie. Okay, I, I think you're right to identify the, uh, this is for Josh also. I think you're right to identify this conceptual gulf uh, in Rawlsian theory between ideal and non-ideal. Um, and I think you're right to observe that this alienates uh, substantial constituencies within the legal community. And so I would say practitioners, um, you know, uh, Hayekian types and natural lawyers are three such constituencies. Uh, but I'm not sure that it's as entirely uh, alien to legal culture. Uh, in fact, it strikes me as somewhat reminiscent of mid 20th century legal positivism, uh, paradigmatically HLA Hart. And I was wondering if you could compare and contrast uh, Hart's conceptual distinction between rules and remedies uh, to the Rawlsian conceptual distinction between ideal and non ideal. I don't think I know the heart literature on rules and remedies well enough to do that. I mean, it's a great question. Um, uh, I mean, are we thinking about the part of the concept of law um, uh, concerned with rules of recognition, or is this just another part of, of Hardian theory? No, it, it's, it's, it is basically that you can you conceive of a, a law as having this this particular kind of recognition. Uh, and that uh, not necessarily part of that concept, any sort of remedy or redress for violation, that these are separate. Oh, that's uh, interesting. And that, th and that they depend on separate considerations, uh, consequentialist considerations about. Um, this also comes up in his theory of punishment, where he says yeah. you might have different goals for Precisely. a system of punishment and, and an individual act of punishment. That's. I never. Sorry? No, I'm sorry. We should let uh, Professor McGinnis ask. Okay, him. well, um, the, the, the short of it is thank you for the question. I have to think about it some more. Uh, uh, my question is to Professor Verrill. Uh, I enjoyed your paper. One way you might think about taking it is also considering uh, temporary constitutions as creating more explicitly the conditions for permanent constitutions. In other words, what is the conditions uh, we could think of a, a pro some process, we could debate what it is, to create a good constitution. But you might think there is a necessary condition of society for that. You might call it a fair constitution, because after all, and probably a temporary constitution only gets you to being a fair constitution. If, if we're constitutionalists, we think the framework of stability is very important to a constitution. and that. That move, I think, might allow you to, uh, while keeping this focused on things with a termination date, put it more in a more general uh, theory of constitution. Yeah, I, I completely agree. That actually would be a great follow-up paper, <laughs> follow-up paper to this one too. Um, one of the things I, 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 I mentioned, I think, in, the, in my talk as well, is that the the 
one of the problems that you see in these transitions is that they tend to be dominated by one group, so the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, for example. So one of the ideal conditions would be to have a more effective political opposition and a well-functioning political marketplace in place so that, you know, you have something close to at least resembling a, to cite Rawls again, a, a Rawlsian veil of, veil of ignorance. But I think that would be a great, great follow-up paper. Thank you for the comment. I, I had a follow-up question for Professor Verrill as well. Um, arguably, the United States had a temporary constitution called mm -hmm. the Articles of Confederation. It actually took us from 1776 until the ratification of the Bill of Rights in 1791, which was 15 years, to get even the first republic established, and even that had to be altered during the Civil War. And even that 15-year founding period of time built on 169 years of colonial experience during which self-government was tried. So um, I think it would be a mistake to think that the Constitution simply emerged out of nowhere in 1787. We really did have a temporary constitution in a way. Yeah, ourselves. certainly. And I, I think in an initial draft of the paper, I, I had a more extensi extensive discussion of the Articles of Confederation. But I decided to tone down the discussion because the Articles were temporary only in hindsight, right? <laughs> because they, <laughs> they sought to establish They're themselves not. in perpetuity. So then that's why I, but you're absolutely right. Because some of the benefits that I talk about with respect to temporary constitutions applies to the Articles of Confederation as well because we certainly learned from that 10-year experiment with the Articles. Oh, great. Yeah. I'd like to thank all five of our young scholars and Tom Merrill for his wonderful comments on their papers. Thank you.